The first six years of my economic life, I wound up broke. Second six years, I wound up rich. Someone says, don't you have to do the second six years like you did the first six years and jot this down. No, no, you don't have to live the second six years like the first six. You can use all the information and all the advice and repairing all of your mistakes and adopting a new and refined philosophy so that the next six years can be totally different than the last six. No other life form can do this. See, if you were a tree, you'd be stuck. As a tree, if you used up all the nourishment that was around you and you couldn't change location, see, you would die. But that's not true. Human beings can change location, go north, south, east, west, live here for a while, live somewhere else for a while. So that's a note to make. You can greatly alter the course of your life. Now, here's the next note to make. Five years from now, you will arrive. The question is where? If you keep up your present disciplines and keep up the present pace that you're on, where will you be in five years? Boy, it's easy to say, hey, I haven't really thought about that. So now make this note. In five years, here's the probability. You will either arrive at a well-designed destination or an undesigned destination. And I promise you, five years from now, you, you really don't want to arrive at an undesigned destination. Because you may very well wind up wearing what you don't want to wear, driving what you don't want to drive, living where you don't want to live, maybe doing what you don't want to do. Simply because you didn't design a better destination. Now, sometimes after we've lived a few years now to repair our mistakes and get back on track, seems like a tough job. If you start early, the fortune belongs to you. If you start early. All fortunes that are available to humans, if you start early, the promise looms large and the odds are heavy in your favor. Now, yes, it's possible to do some radical things starting late and still arrive with some good treasures and some good things. But when you haven't got that much time left, now sometimes the decision has to be so drastic people are not willing to make it and they're too tired and too weary and too ill and say, look, I don't have much time left. It's not going to happen for me anyway. It's easy to take that attitude. But everyone here, we've got the time over the next 10 years. We've got the time the next 20 years. We've got the time the next 30 years to make some repair now in our errors of the past and set up some new disciplines. And I'm telling you, that's going to change everything. So five years from now, I wish for you to arrive at a well-designed place a place of productivity, a place that'll make you feel good about yourself, a place that'll give you honor and respect, a place that'll give you influence to touch other people five years from now that you couldn't do today. Where will you be in five years? Key phrase, we go the direction we face. If you start designing something at the end of this direction, sure enough, you will start going the direction you face. And we face the direction we design. Direction determines destination. Destination is not determined by hope. It's not determined by wish. Destination is determined by direction. You cannot change destination overnight. But here's what you can change today and Overnight, you can change direction. And it is so fascinating what a little small change of direction will do. A few decisions in discipline, a few decisions in learning, a few decisions in change of behavior, change of habit, a few decisions in setting goals that you've sort of let drift before. Like I did at age 25, didn't have a list. I immediately started to change that. And I immediately started to change my direction so that very quickly, I started heading this direction. In less than seven years, I was a millionaire. My father taught me way back. Son, always do more than what you get paid for. Now, some individuals might argue with that. They'd say, no, you're going to mess up the whole program. I know they're wrong. In my own self-interest, I did what my father taught me to always do more than I got paid for. Why? To make an investment in my future. Do more than you get paid for to make an investment in your future. 
and it's paid off for me. If you're wanting that big promotion, are you going to go up to your boss and say, just give it to me? I'll work harder if you just give me that promotion. No, it doesn't work that way. You've got to do more in your current position so that you get noticed, so you stand out from everybody else. So the boss says, hey, we've got this position opening up and I think we should give it to Nancy. She does so much more than we expect. Just imagine what she'll do if we give her this promotion. You've got to do more than you're paid for. You've got to. It's an investment in your future. It's one thing to make a sale. I'm telling you, if you make a sale, you'll make a living. All of us have found ways to make a living. What got interesting for me early on was to figure out ways to make a fortune. You'd say, well, Mr. Roan, how would I deserve to make a fortune? It's easy. Render fortunes of service. People will do things you cannot believe for people who give them good service. Here's one of the greatest gifts you can give anybody, the gift of attention. In return, they will do extraordinary things for your career, take you by the hand and lead you to more people than you could meet by yourself. Always do more than you get paid for. Life responds to deserve, not need. Life was not designed to give us what we need. Life was designed to give us what we deserve. Once you understand that little life principle in your own self-interest, I'm telling you, it's life-changing. The ancient law does not go like this. If you need, you will reap. No, it doesn't work that way. A lot of people out there are hoping it works that way, but no, it doesn't. The ancient law goes like this. If you plant, you will reap. If you sow, you will reap. Somebody says, well, I really need to reap. Well, then you really need to plant in your own self-interest. Your own self-interest needs to be educated in how to plant, how to do it so everybody wins because life doesn't respond to need. You can't go to the soil and say, I need a crop. The soil just smiles at you. And here's what the soil says. Don't bring me your need, bring me some seed. Bring me some effort, bring me some discipline, bring me some interest, bring me some service. Bring me these things and I'll return to you multiplied by two times, five times, 10 times. You can't come with need. You've got to come with seed. You've got to come with willingness. You've got to come with skills. You've got to be willing to learn, willing to change, willing to grow, willing to put yourself out, willing to stand up to the bad weather, willing to pull out the weeds, willing to nurture. That's the only way you get a return. Once you understand these principles, Self-interest now truly becomes an exciting challenge, making sure everybody wins. Enlightened self-interest makes sure that everybody wins. Let me give you a good philosophical phrase. All values must be won by contest. All values must be won by contest. And after they've been won, they must be defended. You say, wow, you've put a pretty heavy task on us. That's what life is all about, a pretty heavy challenge. We don't give large trophies for small effort. If you want to win high health, if you want to win high wealth, if you want to extend a long reach in touching people's lives, you got to engage in some of these extra powerful disciplines. And one is to secure the territory by vigor, and the other is to defend it with equal challenge. Attack. Procrastination, here's another good one, blame. I engaged in this the big share of my life until I met Mr. Show. I used to blame my negative relatives. I used to blame the government. I used to blame taxes. I used to blame prices. I said, it costs too much. Show said, no, let's cover the real problem. You can't afford it. 
I never looked at it like that before. Shof said, sir, you must intellectually understand it's not it that's your problem. It's you that's your problem. It's not out there that's the problem. Out there is like it's been for 6,000 years. You can't cure that. But what you can cure is errors in judgment, errors in attitude, errors in activity, errors in judging results. I found that the errors were within. But see, he had to go after me on that point. Here's the next one. Excuses. Wow. We've got a million. I'm too short. I'm too tall. I'm too old. I'm too young. I don't have the money. I don't have the experience. On and on and on with the excuses. Learning to attack. Very important. Procrastination. That's a good one, front and center. We've got to attack procrastination because it's so insidious. It eats up such large chunks of your life and leaves you in a small corner. Putting it off. Delaying. Letting it slide. Now, I'm one of the best to attack procrastination because I confess to being one of the all-time great procrastinators. I've done a lot of things, but I've put a lot of things off. <laughs> procrastination. I am so good. I could teach it. But I also know the pain of procrastination. I also know the regret that comes from procrastination. I can also show you pieces of my life missing, never to be repaired, because I let it slide. Now see, if we all studied our own lives, and we're trying to help somebody with this insidious disease of procrastination and putting it off. Front and center, we use ourselves as best example. Because you feel the strongest about your own experiences and your own emotions. Do you think you could help somebody with procrastination? Developing this skill of going back, rehearsing your own life and coming up with the essence of the emotion and the experience to try to illustrate to somebody how insidious it can become and how devastating it can leave your life and what will be missing if you let it slide. That's what we call learning to attack the problem. Now, underline the word attack. It's very important to go after the insidious. If the future gets clear, the price gets easier. Because you got to remember, for every promise, there's a price to pay. Everybody's got to pay the price. Everybody's got to do the deal. Everybody's got to do the discipline. Everybody has to pay. But here's what I've discovered. If the promise is clear and powerful, the price is easy to pay. The price is some classes. The price is a few books. The price is a few disciplines. The price is finding something that'll make your life better, make you grow, make you change, make you develop. So the first part of the key is to design the promise. Then what is the price to pay? I'm telling you, the price will be easy. Anybody in my audience no matter where you are, where you come from. Color doesn't matter, religion doesn't matter, where you grew up doesn't matter, circumstances don't matter. I'm telling you, if you'll make the promise of the future clear for yourself, the things you want, the places you want to go, the things you want to have, the person you want to become, the skills you want, the homes you want, the future you want, the friends you want, all of the values of life that you could possibly want. If you'll make that clear, make those lists, and be serious about it. I promise you it's an easy price to pay. Anybody can pay it. And the best advice I can give you is if I can do it, you can do it. Farm boy from Idaho, raised in obscurity. I changed my life, turned it upside down, turned it all around, found economics, found future, found promise. And if I can do it, you can do it. So start setting your goals and see if you can't get a better excitement going for the things you want to accomplish for the future. One of the major reasons for setting goals is for what they make of you in achieving them. My teacher advised me when I first got started at age 25, he said, Jim, why don't you set a goal to become a millionaire? He said, it's got a nice ring to it. You know, enough zeros to impress your accountant. And he said, I'm here to help you. 
You're only 25 years old. You've been to one year of college. You've got a beautiful family, every reason to do it. Why don't you set a goal to become a millionaire? And he said, here's why. And I thought, he doesn't need to teach me why. Wouldn't it be nice to have a million dollars? He said, no, then you'll miss it. He said, here's why. For what it will make of you to achieve it. I'm telling you that statement changed my life. Set the kind of goals that will make something of you to achieve it. He said, now, once you become a millionaire, what's important is not the money. I thought, that's kind of strange teaching. He said, honest, it isn't important. He said, you could just give the money away. Now, I did better than that. I lost it all. By the time I was 31, I was a millionaire. By the time I was 33, I was broke. But when I lost all my money, guess what? I found out Mr. Shope was right. What was valuable was not the money. What was valuable was what I became to earn the money. The skills I had, the knowledge I had about the marketplace, the values that I had going for me, they were more valuable than the money. And here's an important statement to remember. It's not what you get that makes you valuable. It's what you become. So part of the key here is to set the kind of goals that will make something of you. Don't set them too low so that you don't have to grow and you don't have to read and you don't have to try and you don't have to stretch. Don't set them too low. And then don't sell out. Don't go for something that's going to cost you your virtue or cost you your values or sell out your principles. There's a good middle road here to follow. Goals that will inspire. Goals that will help you grow, change, develop, and become better than you are. Okay. Now let's talk about financial independence. How to become rich by 40, 35 if you're extra bright, much sooner if you find an opportunity like I did. Let me show you how I did it. Financial independence. I like the phrase financial independence. Some people are a little bit concerned about using the word becoming rich or becoming wealthy, and I can understand that. I struggled a little bit with this. Is it okay to go for becoming rich, go for becoming wealthy? And maybe that's a bit too strong a word or strong a term. So here's what I've come up with that I think is comfortable for me, and that is how to become financially independent. I think it's every person's heritage here, especially in America, uh, to become financially independent. Now, let me give you my definition of financial independence. Financial independence is the ability to live from the income of your own personal resources. Financial independence. Now it depends on how you want to live. If you need two, three thousand dollars a month, if you need four or five thousand a month, if you need ten thousand a month, some people may need, you know, a hundred thousand a month. But whatever you would need to live, and you could earn that living from the income of your own personal resources, that's what I call financial freedom financial independence. And let me show you how to acquire it. If you start at age 15, between ages 15 and 35 is 20 years. And in my personal opinion, based on my own studies and my own experience, 20 years, in my opinion, is enough time to become financially independent. If you're not, you don't live in the wrong country. Probably what's happened is you have the wrong plan. And it's easy to be a nice person with the wrong plan. I found that when I was 25 years old. I was broke at age 25, and I was a nice guy. You would have liked me. But I'm telling you, my plans up until then, especially my financial plan, left me broke. I totally changed it the next six years, and I became financially independent. So I know what I'm talking about. It is possible in a reasonable amount of time, 15 to 35. Whatever, 20 years time, enough time. You can do it in a much shorter period of time, like I did if you want to. But this is a reasonable enough time. But here's number one. First of all, you got to have the right philosophy. Philosophy is our ability to gather knowledge and sort through it and decide what's valuable. To develop a philosophy about life, a philosophy about our health, a philosophy about our family relationships a philosophy about economics. And if you develop the right philosophy, that's what helps to set this sail so that in six years it takes you where you want to go instead of winding up like I did that first six years of my economics, broke, no money, empty bank account. The right philosophy. Now let me give you a couple of philosophies to consider. Here's the first one. It's called the philosophy of the poor. And here it is. Poor people 
usually spend their money and invest what's left. That's the philosophy of the poor. Now here's the philosophy of the rich. Rich people invest their money and spend what's left. And here's the startling answer. It really doesn't matter what the amount is. What's most important is not the amount. What's really important is the philosophy. So I would ask you to adopt this philosophy of spending after you have invested. Invest first, then spend. And I've got a little formula that I'm going to share with you. Now, what should a child do with a dollar? I mean, there's a lot of debate going on, I'm sure, across the country on what a child should do with a dollar. Here's one opinion. It's only a child and it's only a dollar. What difference does it make? Well, in my opinion, it makes all the difference in the world. A person's economic future starts with a child with a dollar. Somebody says, oh, no, you're only young once. Let him spend it all. Well, when would you hope that would stop? Somebody says, well, wait till he's 50 and broke like me, and, you know, and then he'll learn. Well, no, we don't want to wait that long. If I would have known earlier than age 25, I would have changed. In high school, if, I, if they would have had classes called Wealth One, Wealth Two, I'd have taken both classes. I would not have waited until age 25. So, the earlier the better. So, what should a child do with a dollar? Here's the simple premise to begin with. Don't spend it all. And if a child wants to spend the whole dollar, you got to say, hey, don't spend it all. You know, don't spend it all. They'll say, why not? It's my dollar. I earned it. You say, I know you earned it, but don't spend it all. They'll still say, why not? Say, let me show you why not. So you put them in your car, take them to the other side of town, and show them where people live that spend the whole dollar. Just drive them around. Kids learn best by visual. Just drive around and say, would you like to live here? Kid says, no. Would you like to live like these people live? Kid says, no, no. Then you can't spend the whole dollar. So, kids will get the message. So, you know, take them to the other side of town and show them around. Unless you already live there and then just show them around. Anyway, don't spend the whole dollar. Now, let me give you my best view of what to do with the dollar. And I promise you, if you started at age 15, now if you're over 15, right, you still got plenty of time. You still got 20 years. You know, if you're 30, you still got 20 years. I mean, you know, you still got plenty of time to start what I'm about to share with you. What to do with a dollar. Here's my first bit of advice. Never spend more than 70 cents. Never spend more than 70 cents. Now you gotta pick some number and the number you pick is gonna be determined by your philosophy. It's gonna be determined by what you've been taught or your experience teaching yourself. When I first met my teacher, Mr. Shof, I was at about 110% of each dollar. You know, I'm down at budget finance, hawking my furniture and my car one more time. And then I learned a whole better formula for financial independence. Number one, don't spend more than 70 cents. Now, kids say to me, well, okay, what do I do with the other 30 cents? And here's what I teach them. 10 cents for charity. Charity or church or helping people that can't help themselves. Ten cents to support worthy projects, projects that you feel good about. Ten cents out of every dollar. It's called being generous with part of what you've taken out of society. Now, in my opinion, nothing teaches us character better than generosity. No class, no teacher, no book teaches, generos teaches character better than generosity. And the best time to start is when the amounts are small, and I know if kids learn these lessons well, they'll give a dime out of a dollar, help people that can't help themselves, support worthy projects. Or if you belong to a church, they teach tithe, peace of. It's very important. Now, because when the amounts get larger, sometimes it's a little more difficult. You know, giving 100000 out of a million, someone says, oh, if I had a million, I'd give 100000 I'm not sure. That's a lot of money. So the time to start is when the amounts are small. Ten cents out of the dollar. Okay, next 10 cents, I call active capital. Active capital means do something to make a profit. Active capital. Set aside a portion of your income 
Wages are okay, but I'm telling you, wages will make you a living. Profits will make you a fortune. So set aside part of your income as capital, called active capital. Any kind of project you can possibly think of, you can possibly come up with. I'm going to write a new book, I think, for kids. I think the title is going to be, of course, Kids Should Pay Taxes. It's kind of an interesting title. In California, kids do pay taxes. When a child walks into 7-Eleven, buys something that costs a dollar, the proprietor says, give me seven more pennies. And the child says, hey, what's these seven pennies for? And the proprietor says, that's the taxes. Kid says, well, hey, I'm only eight years old. Proprietor says, congratulations, you're my youngest taxpayer. Give me the money. So in California, where I live, kids do pay taxes. Big question is, should they? And my book will answer that question. Of course, kids should pay taxes. Nothing is for free. If you want to ride your bicycle on the sidewalk instead of in the mud, you got to pay the seven pennies. Nothing is free, so we all have to pay. So, 10 cents out of your living, out of the money you earn, set aside for capital. Capital to try your best to show a profit. And in my book, it's going to be all kinds of ways kids can make money, right? Two bicycles, one to ride and one to rent. I mean, you know, it doesn't take long to figure out some enterprise that'll start making a profit. Then you must jot this down if you're taking notes. Profits are better than wages. One, you can't usually start wages until you're about 16, 15, 16, but you can make a profit long before you're eligible to start earning wages. And then there's no limit to profits and they can, they can double and triple and quadruple. You know, there's no limit. It's incredible how fast profits can grow. So profits are better than wages. Wages make you a living. Profits make you a fortune. Now, the third 10 cents is vitally important. I call it passive capital. Capital you let somebody else use. A financial institution, stocks and bonds, mutual funds, whatever. Let someone else use it. You furnish the money. They use it to make a profit, but they pay you for the use of it called interest. And here's one of the things that'll make you financially independent fairly quickly, and that's called compound interest. And this is how you get it. Letting someone else use a portion of your money, your substance. They show the profit, they pay you interest. And this passive capital, I'm telling you, over a sustained period of time, if you'll develop this little 10, 10, 10, and 70, especially starting at age 15, I'm telling you, by the time you're 35, you will be financially independent. You'll have the ability to live from the income of your own resources. And then one more point on passive capital. There's a Bible philosophy. I'm an amateur on the Bible. But there's a Bible philosophy that teaches the borrower is servant to the lender. And if you want to be in a powerful position as you grow older, Finally, when you become mature, maybe have your own business, things have worked out for you for the future. The position you always want to be in is the power position, and that's called the lender. The lender is the power position. So if kids learn early enough, and then you ask them what they'd like to be when they grow up, I'm telling you, once they understand, they'll say, well, one of the things I want to be is one of those lenders. That's the power position, not the spender. No, you'll be pitied the rest of your life if you just become a spender. You gotta become a lender. And I think this is one formulas to follow. 10 cents out of every dollar. Let someone else use it. Be the lender, power position. Then try to show a profit. Can't we teach our children how to take a dollar, search the neighborhood, find a broken wagon, pay a dollar for it, bring it home, you know, clean it up, sand it until it's clean, paint it red till it shines, straighten out the wheels till they're true, take it back to the neighborhood, sell it for $5. Anybody can do that. Now, does the child deserve $4 profit? And the answer is yes, society now has a mended wag. That's what America's all about. Finding something, touching it, making it better, making a profit, taking part of your resources, helping people who can't help themselves. Let someone else use it to make a profit. Some projects require more capital than one person has. Exciting. And then let them pay you for the use of it. America's had this philosophy now all these years. Communism has taught all these years capital belongs in the hands of the state, not in the hands of the people. We've been teaching all these years capital belongs in the hands of the people, not in the hands of the state. And we turned out to be right. 
Capital in the hands of the kids, capital in the hands of the people. Enterprises that make a profit, enterprises that grow, it's the hope of our future. So that little simple formula, I hope will help you. Now one more key on financial independence and that is attitude. Attitude. Here's number one. I used to say, I hate to pay my bills. My teacher straightened me out on that. He said, let's see, Mr. Owen, what you hate to do is pay $100 on an account and reduce your liabilities and increase your assets. I said, well, no, not if you look at it that way. He said, well, it all depends on how you look at it. So wouldn't you love to pay your bills, reduce your liabilities, increase your assets? You've got to have that kind of attitude. 